Hello, lovelies. Well, first of all, I have to give a shout out to Hong Kong. Did you know that I'm the 49th most popular <laughs> history podcast in Hong Kong? Who knew? I feel like, you know that Tom Waits song, I'm big in Japan. Well, I feel like I'm big in Hong Kong. So thank you, guys. It's just such a, I don't know, such a treat. Thank you so much. But I'm going to pay you back by going on a rant today. <laughs> and it's going to be about the danger of making assumptions because you'll see why. You'll see what you're missing out on. And look, the fact is it's easy to make assumptions. All you need is incomplete information and the laziness or unwillingness to ask the questions you need to ask to have actual facts. And without complete information, you get to fill in the blanks yourself. And that's fun, right? You use your beliefs or your understanding of past experiences or what you've been told by teachers or experts, all most likely residing within our materialistic prison paradigm, which, as we know, dispatch any data that might be embarrassing to the materialistic construct. So armed with this quote unquote information then we connect the dots that aren't there and as a result boom we jump to conclusions that are wrong sometimes I've done it and I'm sure I do it all the time but today I'm going to talk about one assumption that irks me particularly because it's wrong and it's ubiquitous and it's stopping us from I don't know a huge opportunity Okay, <laughs> so strap in, people. Here we go. When uh, we released Magically Egypt season two, I was really surprised by some people's reaction to it. And again, as a result of the roundtable we did the other day with Brad and John, I got the same response. But to be honest, I shouldn't be surprised as it took I mean, in all honesty, right, Magical Egypt 1 took about 10 years to really catch on or for people to catch up to it. I don't know, right? I can say that because I had nothing to do with the creative. I'm just a fangirl. But it did take a while for it to reach mass consciousness. So that might be what will happen with season two. But back to the point. <laughs> What Brad and Gary and Chance and the entire team were trying to do was to show us what they believe to be the point of ancient Egypt. And they think it's pretty damn important and relevant to us today. But people are dismissing it because of an assumption, a stupid, provably wrong assumption. It's pissing me off and it's a huge pity. Now, look, again, as I explained, I think, in episode two, history is only a story, right? There is no history. It's just a story. And this is their story. But they believe that the point of ancient Egypt is to direct us to something that we're supposed to be doing. And in doing it, it answers the most important thing about us. The answer to the question, what am I and what am I supposed to be doing here? And just like most of this stuff, it's not what you think it is at all. Well, in their opinion anyway, right? But when the boys started looking at the art, what they saw was a spiritual technology or a metaphysical technology encoded there, right? <laughs> that directs us to the mechanisms of our brain, our body, and our nervous system, not to just find some curious, interesting facts about ourselves, but because a fundamental aspect of our destiny as humans involves activating and bringing these mechanisms online. Now, Chance talks about it as a meta-orgasm and kind of being part of a meta-puberty, right? Like a second puberty that, that you go through. When you have this cascading flood of ions that does something to your magnetic field, the magnetic field grows and grows, and he thinks this is the reason for the depiction of the halos right behind the heads of Jesus and people who are enlightened and ancient arts of all kinds. The halo indicates you've been through this process and have become a finished person. They are an adult in the metaphysical sense, 
They are completed like the Pharaoh is with the risen snake. You are a metaphysical adult instead of a metaphysical prepubescent. It's so funny because this literally just came up on my Facebook page. And this is how my friend Stuart Savatsky explains it. Vibrant well-being, overwhelming ecstasy, effugently enlightened consciousness, the guiding force of human evolution, the pathway to an endless eroticism, the great mother or procreatrix, the deification, regeneration, and immortalization of the body, the somatic basis of all religious, moral, or spiritual aspirations, the teleological freeing of soul from flesh via the literal unwinding of the mortal coil into its constituent elements, the lost wisdom of the serpent of Genesis, the fuel of all human genius, the energy of the Dionysian revelry, the spiritual side of DNA concentrated at the base of the spine, Christ's fiery baptism and that of his followers ever since, the seething cobra sheltering Lord Buddha. Such are the ancient and modern claimed cross-cultural manifestations of this developmental force. I mean, that is fucking intense, right? (laughs) And again, it's a good story and I like it. But you know what I hear? That it can't be true because the ancient Egyptians did not care about the brain because they ripped it out of the head during mummification. And so all of this good stuff is being dismissed because of that. Well now, did they? Did the ancient Egyptians rip the brain out of the skull during mummification? Sure, sometimes, but now I'm not going to take credit for this because Brad Clausen was also hmm, aggravated by this. <laughs> and he sent me an email of, quote, a quick search for other mummies found with their brains, unquote. And as he found, and to quote again, seems like not all mummies went through the excerebration. And some brains were left in the skull and just shrank. Also, interestingly, the Old Kingdom pyramid builders did not remove the brain. Here are two articles on the same story. End quote. So I'm not going to bore you here by reading all of these articles, but I will post them in case you care to read them yourself. But here is my point. <laughs> As I've shown earlier in this podcast, there is no history, there are only stories. And the stories about ancient Egypt change over time and within paradigms. Some stories, like the fact that the ancient Egyptians were pre-philosophical, incapable of coherent or systematic thought and giving itself to expressing itself in rather crude imagery, or that the ancient Egyptians did not know or care about the brain because they pulled it out of the nose through mummification, which are taught in school, can cause us to make erroneous assumptions, preventing us from even listening to news stories that who knows, who knows, who knows if they're correct, right? But I tell you what, they are a hell of a lot more meaningful and life-affirming, and awe-inspiring, and curiosity-stimulating than the other stories. And who knows what might come out of it if we took it all a bit more seriously. Brad is actually incredibly pragmatic about it. He simply believes that the ancients knew how to access states that provided them information that allowed them to do amazingly cool things, and that we could access it too if we only had eyes to see and stop making stupid assumptions. So rant over. I love you guys. (laughs) Oh, more soon. 